Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to see a lot of you back here for the second day of our conference. Um, my name is Richa Shivakodi. I'm a research area lead on migration governance here at the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Migration and Integration. Um, I will be co-chairing this uh, session with um, my colleague, Dr. Melissa Kelly, who will be um, uh, collecting questions from Zoom. And um, to start off, we have a distinguished uh, panel here this morning. Um, we'll be talking about narratives of city-states. And um, for many of these smaller city-states that um, we talk about today, migration has uh, played a pivotal role uh, in the development of um, the city-states. And it's become an indes indispensable feature for their fast-paced uh, growth. And, um, but then we also have to think about the integration of uh, migrants, uh, city states, and if it has been equitable and inclusive. And um, for uh, a lot of the migrants, it really depends on uh, the type of visas or skill sets they bring in. Um, today we'll be um, Having looking at cases from Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, and we're talking about immigration, but also emigration uh, from these uh, city states. Our first uh, speaker is Professor Elaine Ho, who is a professor in the Department of Geography and is also a senior research associate uh, fellow uh, at the Asia Research Institute at uh, the National University of Singapore, uh, my alma mater. <laughs> Um, she's presenting on uh, migration narratives in Singapore from economic imperatives to counter perspectives on ethnicity and age. Our second speaker is Professor Eric Fong, who is the chair professor in sociology and the head of department um, of sociology at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, he is going to be speaking on uh, narratives uh, of governing emigration, a case study from Hong Kong. Um, and I was telling them earlier, um, I know both of them from uh, when I was a student at uh, the National University of Singapore, and we used to have a migration reading group, a graduate student um, informal reading group where Elaine was um, helping direct us, but uh, Professor Eric Fong was one of the speakers in one of those series, and we had the discussion on one of his papers, so Good to see you come all the way from Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, so I think we'll go right into the presentations. Uh, I'd like to invite Professor Elaine Ho to present. You both have 15 minutes and Mansi here will be showing you a play card uh, on the time time keep it, keeping. Uh, so. Okay, good morning, everyone. I just want to thank the organizers for giving us this opportunity to share our research in progress. Uh, in the interest of time, let me just launch uh, straight into the presentation. So in this presentation on Singapore, I'm uh, situating my analysis in three sets of literature, first on managed migration, uh, secondly on uh, urban diversity, and more specifically, uh, situating the uh, analysis in the politics of multiculturalism and what I call the politics of co-ethnicity. And the third set of literature that I will be engaging with has to do with social reproduction. Um, and in this case, uh, I will, I'm referring particularly to uh, aging. Um, so who cares for um, seniors or older people in Singapore and uh, about migrants themselves who are aging in Singapore and uh, linking this to the idea of global care chains. Uh, Again, in the interest of time, I won't go into the literature itself, but uh, I will refer to it uh, as I go on with my presentation. So in Singapore, um, Singapore deploys a managed migration approach very much like uh, countries in like Canada, Australia, and it uses managed migration to recruit young mi migrants, younger migrants to compensate for two uh, demographic challenges, declining fertility uh, and a rapidly aging society. So research uh, on Singapore Singapore's migration experience has largely focused on what Brenda Yeo has called the bifurcation of skilled and low-skilled labor. So it's very much about uh, differences in class. And this uh, set of literature that has uh, emerged sort of uh, engages with ideas around privilege versus precarity, uh, assuming that uh, skilled migrants you know, are more privileged, lower skilled migrants have more precarious working conditions. Uh, and at the same time, because of the urban diversity that's uh, observable within Singapore, uh, these kinds of migration 
patterns, uh, the, the diversity of migration patterns also surfaces uh, politics around multiculturalism as well as cosmopolitanism. Uh, I won't refer so much to cosmopolitanism in today's uh, uh, presentation, but I have uh, written on it uh, in the past. So other research on migration patterns in Singapore has looked at marriage migration, so-called study mothers uh, who accompany young children uh, uh, from abroad to study in Singapore, as well as older international students. Uh, what I want to highlight in this presentation is the paucity of research on the new entrepreneurs and investor migrants that have been actively courted uh, by the Singaporean government. Uh, so there is currently a disconnect between academic research and their visibility in both uh, narratives in the mass media as well as social media news. So overall, I would say that um, Discussions of uh, migration in Singapore have largely focused on the economics, uh, economistic aspects uh, of migration. And at the same time, the government's uh, sort of emphasis on the benefits, economic benefits that uh, migrants can bring circulate alongside another set of narratives about the pre-independence migration histories of Singapore. So people like me, uh, we are actually... Um, I'm born and bred in Singapore, but my grandfather, my grandparents were from China. And in Singapore, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, uh, because of these migrant histories, uh, we practice uh, sort of a framework of multiculturalism. And there are three official uh, groups that are recognized, uh, Chinese, Malay, Indians, and then another category of others, which uh, encompasses Eurasians and other types you know, of uh, ethnic groups in Singapore. But uh, the rest of this presentation will focus mainly on the politics that have become uh, visible because of new Chinese immigration and uh, new Indian immigration to Singapore. So these two types of immigrants, they kind of um, inhabit Singapore alongside, you know, uh, sort of a uh, people like me, okay, who are actually descendants of migrants. And this narrative around the pioneer migrants um, in Singapore uh, and, and their descendants actually are closely interlinked, okay, with the uh, new uh, sort of tensions around immigration in Singapore. This presentation will focus on uh, how state-led migration narratives in Singapore emphasize economic benefits that are allegedly to be uh, reaped from migration. So these are sort of um, top-down proposed truths. But underlying such narratives, as I will discuss, are the um, are Singaporeans' counter-narratives of economic competition and co-ethnic tensions with the migrants uh, who have newly arrived from China and India. And what I want to highlight in this presentation is how that compels the government to respond. So this is the first part of the presentation. But I also want to emphasize that um, these new migration patterns surfaces yet to be tackled questions over how some groups of migrants are aging in Singapore alongside its own growing local population. So overall, uh, the findings inform academic understandings of the tensions between uh, narratives of multiculturalism versus the politics of co-ethnicity, as well as the social, as the as well as the role of social reproduction in circuits of migration. So I've given you kind of the overall argument in case I run out of time. Okay, so uh, managed migration in Singapore is used to fill low-skilled uh, 3D jobs as well as domestic work. And um, this kind of migration uh, exists alongside what uh, the Singapore government calls talent migration. Uh, and this kind of talent migration courts highly skilled professionals to fill skill shortages. So the low skilled migrants, they hold limited work visas and have restricted working rights. Employers have to pay levies in order to employ low skilled migrants and their hiring quotas for non-domestic work. So uh, at the same time, uh, skilled migrants, they face growing restrictions, okay? For example, increasing uh, expectations of how much they should earn in order to qualify for employment visas and what we call mid-skilled S passes. Uh, the route towards permanent residency and citizenship has also become more restrictive since 2011. So 2011 was a watershed mo uh, moment because the Singapore government experienced, uh, the ruling party experienced a decline in votes uh, 
and political observers uh, say that in the 2011 elections, it was because the population was uh, unhappy with the pro-immigration policies of the government. Uh, at the same time, alongside these growing restrictions, there have been the creation of new visa categories for entrepreneur and investor migrants. And in particular for the investor migrants, just as in the case of Canada, I'm not sure if it's still the case, but it certainly was uh, when I was a postdoc here years ago. Um, investor migration can be a means as, uh, towards fast track permanent residency. What I want to highlight here is actually this year, um, the Singapore government introduced a modified points-based system. And the points-based system is actually new in Singapore. But what's interesting about the government's approach is that if you can see um, in the column on the left-hand side, that the points-based approach also takes into account whether firms are complying with certain uh, emphasis that the government want to encourage. For example, um, that employers shouldn't just uh, employ from particular ethnic groups. Um, does the firm actually increase the diversity of the, uh, does the recruitment of this migrant increase the diversity of the firm? Does the firm sufficiently support local employment, et cetera? So I'm not sure if this is unique to Singapore, if it exists in other countries, and perhaps some of you can share with me if you know it exists in other countries. Uh, what I want to emphasize from the preceding strides is that these restrictive policy changes actually reflect the Singapore government's response to concerns expressed by Singaporeans. What I call the counter narratives to do with career and social mobility competition from foreigners um, and their concern that employers are choosing to hire lower cost skilled foreigners, particularly those from the same source countries as the recruitment managers who are themselves migrants, oftentimes from India or China. So such counter narratives of migration actually um, highlight wider tensions to do with Singaporeans' concern about uh, co-ethnic identity and differentiating themselves from the newer immigrants who come from India and China. So I've already uh, written actually uh, about the politics of co-ethnicity and migration in this book, Citizens in Motion. And uh, I won't go into very much detail except to highlight that uh, even though the Singapore government doesn't release very much migration data for us to with, but on the ground, people can see that the largest cohorts of migrants are from India and uh, China. And I'm referring to the new immigrants. And this has to do partly with the ease of recruitment from these source countries, but also uh, the government's emphasis on achieving racial balance to maintain that um, proportion of Chinese, Malay, Indians uh, in Singapore. So Frost has referred to this as the racialized governance of migration. And I want to highlight that it intersects actually with Singaporeans' own integration expectations of these new immigrants. Uh, I think, you know, maybe I'll just quickly highlight that um, people, uh, Singaporeans are concerned in particular with um, how the Indian new immigrants, you know, are overrepresented in certain uh, sectors, as well as increasing numbers of entrepreneur and investor migrants from China. Uh, Singaporeans are found both on social media as well as through my interviews. Um, they express resentment towards these co-ethnics from India and China for their conspicuous consumption, as well as refer to a sense of difference between these co-ethnics and them. And the Singapore government itself has also become increasingly concerned about whether these new immigrants, especially the ones from China, are loyal to Singapore. So it has um, in mind in particular whether China can have influence over Singapore's domestic politics uh, through the role of these uh, new immigrants. Um, in this slide, I just want to highlight that, you know, in the research I've done, the migrants have actually uh, sort of countered these narratives, so mocking Singaporeans for the stereotypes towards them, um, and a colleague of mine um, in Singapore uh, has done research with Indian immigrants, and they say these Indian immigrants actually mock the class status of the locally born Indians who, whose ancestors, you know, they say were uh, actually coolies who had come to Singapore. Uh, other work uh, on SPAS, the middling skilled migrants uh, in Singapore, also highlight that they do not lead privileged lives, um, as claimed, you know, um, by some Singaporeans. So what I want to emphasize here is that the intersectional differences between co-ethnics are actually not easily captured uh, through conventional framings of multiculturalism, but in real life, these tensions characterize the everyday encounters between migrants and Singaporeans. So I'm quickly running out of time, I'm going to speak through the rest of my slides on aging. The second part of my paper actually talks about uh, how looking at aging and uh, how it intersects with migration uh, 
helps us to better understand the role of social reproduction in circuits of migration. So aging discourses and migration discourses are normally discussed separately in Singapore. And the Singapore government uh, often reminds uh, Singaporeans that Singapore will become a super aged society by 2026. And managed migration is meant to mitigate the effects of aging on the local economy. And I want to highlight three ways in which actually uh, the government's narratives haven't surfaces other aspects of aging and migration. The first has to do with the role of foreign domestic workers who have been brought in uh, from Southeast Asian countries to provide care for seniors in Singapore. And it's their migration to Singapore has actually enabled Singaporean women to join the local workforce, uh, as well as uh, providing support, elder care support in the home. Uh, what recent research has highlighted is that these foreign domestic workers are themselves aging in Singapore. Because of the way that um, the Singapore visa system is structured, there's a perception that they are temporary labor force. But in fact, you know, some of them have renewed their visas incrementally and they have aged in Singapore. And their working in Singapore actually raises concerns over how, to, how will they manage their um, healthcare costs if they run into healthcare problems uh, while working in Singapore, as well as the cost to the emotional bonds between they and their social support networks back in their home countries uh, because of the many years that they have spent outside of their home countries. So this is the first aspect uh, in which aging intersects with migration in Singapore. The second aspect has to do with our research that I've recently concluded on grandparenting migrants in Singapore. So these are grandparents from China with Chinese nationality who come to Singapore to help their migrant children with childcare work. And they are actually supporting the Singapore economy, but yet they don't have longer term residency rights or social protection rights. Okay. And the third one that I want to highlight is actually research that um, Brenda Yu and myself are carrying out currently on uh, aging migrants, okay, who were recruited by the Singapore government uh, as skilled migrants in the 1990s. Uh, fast forward three decades later, they are now in their late 50s, 60s and older. And so they themselves constitute part of the aging population in Singapore as well. Um, however, there's very little attention paid to their aging needs. Uh, and they actually have had to negotiate integration experiences across the life course while retaining ties with their homelands and other country. And our argument is that looking at their experiences of integration and aging actually helps us to uh, understand better some of the uh, kind of assumptions that we may have about how immigrants should integrate, as well as how they fit within the multicultural framework in Singapore uh, from a longitudinal perspective, so across their life course. Uh, importantly, they're also experiencing shifting episodes of vulnerability and agency as they transition into later life. And this is because their own adult children may actually have remigrated to other North American or European countries and they're no longer there um, with their aging parents. So their social support networks are also quite different from local Singaporeans because uh, in their earlier life, uh, sorry, not earlier life, in the earlier years of their life, they had uh, mainly interacted with other immigrants who are themselves um, aging, you know, alone in Singapore or who may have subsequently remigrated. So some of the uh, assumptions about elder care in Singapore, which the Singapore government uh, frames its policies around, uh, the importance of the family, importance of the community community may actually not apply very much okay to these um, aging immigrants so I think you know these three aspects of migration actually intersect with aging in ways that illustrate how the concepts of social reproduction helps us to look at economic and um, uh, perhaps non-economic aspects of migration concurrently Okay, I think my time is nearly up, right? Okay, conclusion. So um, I think what I've tried to highlight in this presentation in a very, very uh, short period of time is um, that while the prevailing migration narratives promoted by the Singapore government emphasizes the economic benefits um, of migration, uh, it itself controls migration with what we would observe as a fine tooth comb. So it's really very carefully calibrated. However, what the government didn't expect was the um, outlash um, by the public Singaporeans towards uh, its pro-immigration policies, okay, in 2011. And thereafter, it then had to adjust its migration policies to uh, satisfy some of the concerns of Singaporeans, and that remains, uh, continues up to today, okay? And what these um, 10, uh, what the unexpected outlash actually reveals is the tensions around co-ethnicity um, that is insufficiently addressed within a multicultural framework that only looks at the separation or differences between um, distinct uh, ethnic groups. So um, 
the arrival of co-ethnics, new co-ethnics from India and China actually uh, reveals the limitations of Singapore's multiculturalism framework. Okay, and I think the Singapore government has not directly addressed how aging intersects with migration concerns in Singapore. Um, so what I've tried to highlight here is how narratives of societal steering, okay, by the Singapore government actually collides with the lived realities of migration for ordinary people. So in some ways, you know, the government has been able to adjust, but at the same time, the second part of my uh, presentation on aging wants to emphasize that uh, we do need to go beyond uh, sort of simplistic and snapshot depiction on migration to also look at it with a longitudinal view in mind as migrants themselves age. And on that note, I will stop my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Ho, for your insightful presentation um, and introducing us to the narratives uh, and politics related to co-ethnicity and managed migration in Singapore. Now I'd like to uh, invite Professor uh, Eric Fong to uh, present. You also have 15 minutes. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, very nice to be here. And thank you for invite me, um, inviting me to this um, very, very um, interesting um, conference to hear about uh, migration issues in different parts of the world. And let me congratulate Anna for such a successful um, conference. Um, today, what I'm going to discuss with you is about a, um, a topic or a social event that is still unfolding. It's about the mass, I would say mass immigration uh, from Hong Kong. Um, you may think that while why, why we are in, in Canada or in different parts of the world, why we consider about um, you know, the immigration um, from a small city in, in East Asia. But if you read um, some of the major newspaper, no matter Wall Street Journal, so um, uh, um, New York Times, or even Economist, or here Group and Mail, or uh, in, in England, the Guardians, um, they all talk about this um, particular social events because there's quite a number of people uh, moving out of Hong Kong for a short period of time. And also, I would like to mention that the event that I'm going to talk about is still unfolding. Um, I received a, a, a text message from uh, um, uh, reporter from the South China Morning Post, um, which is uh, the major newspaper uh, in Hong Kong um, today, and he told, and she told me that um, the the British government will extend and um, further relax the um, the the policy to allow um, Hong Kong residents to move to um, UK. Um, so um, she wants to ask me about she asked me about the comment on this. So you can see that things have been really. Um, um, unfolding. If you have some friends uh, uh, of you, if you walk around um, Toronto, city of Toronto, especially, you will see a lot of young people uh, recently arrived from Hong Kong. So um, definitely, this is a, um, a very interesting topic, uh, at least from the East Asian perspective, and also from the migration perspective. The reason why this is the case is because uh, most of the time when we talk about migration, we are always talk about the economic migrant. But I think lately, I think two years ago, when um, Doug Messi, um, um, Douglas Messi at Princeton um, start, um, started to talk about that we should also talk, um, look at the political uh, driven migrant. And because we spend too much time on looking at the, or we, we have already spent a lot of times looking at the economic uh, driven migrant, but then the political driven migrant, um, we haven't spent too much time on that. So, um, in fact, I have been working on, based on this immigration wave, I'm uh, start to look at the political driven uh, immigration and try to uh, link up with the, the economic uh, driven uh, migration. But anyhow, so today what I'm going to discuss is about the narrative of governing uh, immigration a case study um, in Hong Kong. I collaborate with a, a group of my students, some of them are computer scientists, and um, because um, we are using the machine learning to, um, to work on some of the data. All right, so um, as you know, that media narratives sometimes are usually uh, are used by the government to frame and define the issue, if, even to influence um, citizens' perceptions of the issue. And media narrative, especially the newspaper report, represent the attention of various institutional actors in a society beyond the government, or the thinking of key opinion leaders of how they want the event to be seen by the public. And these actors may coordinate uh, with and complement the government effort, or they may be in conflict with the government as they present their wills to the public. 
Um, however, when we look at the research on migration, we're usually focusing on the perception or sentiments of local residents um, um, when there are large waves of immigration or emigration. But then um, because of this um, conference um, pushed me to think about that, actually few observers realize that their views can be influenced by the narrative of government and various um, institutional actors or key opinion leaders in the society. So I thought that that, um, without fully understanding the narratives that shape their wills, we cannot fully grasp the, the picture of the way that uh, local residents form their opinions and sentiments about immigration issues. Because I think most of the, the time, the way they think about immigration or immigration mainly is through this kind of um, narrative that shape their will. So our analysis focused on the media narratives in Hong Kong about immigration in the past two years um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the general public discourse usually suggested that the recent wave of immigration is related to the large scale social unrest uh, in 2019 and the perceived societal changes that follow. So um, in this paper, we've um, started to explore two questions um, um, raised by this situation. The first one is, what are the major themes of the narratives of the government? Are, are there institutional actors and key opinion leaders that help to reshape the common public views of the immigration wave in Hong Kong? And secondly, how do the narrative ne legitimize the point of view um, they are presenting? So, um, so theoretically, um, the discussion we hope to illustrate how the government handle issues relate to migration by reframing the issues. Though our study is about immigration, I think that the finding can have implica uh, implications for times when a society faces a large wave of uh, immigration or refugees or other social issues. And through the media, the government provide a justification for its policy. Um, based on our analysis um, on the newspaper article in Hong Kong, um, we identify five major themes, and um, those major themes we are going to discuss in details later. So let me um, quickly just to go over with you some of the literature. Um, so the government usually, they, um, uh, government company communicates through media as to deliver the messages um, that legitimize the migration policy. Um, institutional actors, they need to use the media to express the position to persuade the public and opinion leader use uh, media to express their wills with hopes of asserting their influence. So if the position of newspaper are largely tilted towards the government wills uh, in a society, all these different actors will play a similar role to support similar position, but from different angles. So the significant consequences of framing uh, are to shape the attitude and behavior of um, individuals, sometimes we call it the strategic social construction, and they shape the share meaning and interpretation of the UNs. So these actors, they develop their frames, which are uh, aspects of perceived reality make more prominent and connect them with the storyline. So successful storyline organize experience and enabling a new understanding of the problem. This actor then develop frames which are aspects of perceived reality make more prominent and connect them with storylines. So um, even though there has been considerable research um, on political actor framing migration related UN, many such studies have focused on immigration with relative um, little discussion about the ways um, the political actors frame immigration, the impact of immigration on sending um, society basic, um, but then we think that should not be underestimated. Um, and therefore, if we talk about why people moving uh, out and then how the, um, the destiny, uh, how the origin, uh, place of origin, the, um, um, the, um, take care of the UN, I think that is also quite important to understand. Most of the time, I think from the literature, they're always referring as the brain drain. Um, but beyond that, we see seldom, um, you know, other discussion or other narrative to discuss about immigration. So, um, so in order to um, give you an idea about this uh, immigration wave um, after the tr um, 2019 social movement, let me 
quickly uh, give you a brief uh, um, outline. So Hong Kong has witnessed a significant wave of immigration in the wake of, in the wake of um, 2019, the uh, anti-extradition law amendment bill movement and the introduction of the national security law in mid-2020. I think in the 2019, we uh, have seen a lot of um, the newspaper report about the, the social movement uh, in Hong Kong for the half, uh, half year. So according to the data from the Census and Statistics Department, the local population experienced a 3% decline between in mid-2019 and mid-2020, decreasing from 7.2 um, millions to 7.29 um, uh, million. So this is uh, quite a substantial amount. And the Hong Kong government recent policy address disclosed a reduction in the local workforce by approximately 140,000 over the past two years. Again, this is a, a pretty large number. And uh, lately, when I had the meeting with the Hong Kong um, General Chamber of Commerce, they all um, complain about uh, a lot of people in different industry, in different companies, uh, move out of Hong Kong. And they are um, lacking of um, 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 the, um, you know, experienced worker to replace them. So concurrently, because um, why there's so many people moving out, um, there's of course a push factor and then also the pull factor. The pull factor is because um, um, the British government introduced the new British national overseas visa, allowing Hong Kong residents who were formerly British overseas territory citizen to live, work and study in the United Kingdom. So a lot of people take advantage of this. And after residing there for five years, they could apply for the permanent residence. Um, Australia and Canada also offer pathway for recent graduate from Hong Kong or individuals holding the British um, national overseas passport to work and settle uh, in the countries. And I think in Canada, they call it the, the lifeboat program. So with relaxed immigration requirement and the societal changes, many Hong Kong residents, they opt to immigrate. Um, they, they intention to immigrate further are uh, fueled by the reduced cost of immigration. So due to rare program uh, implemented by other country to ease the financial burden for Hong Kong residents relocating and concern about, um, they perceive the repression for those actively involved in the protest movement. So, um, Amid the increasing immigration wave in Hong Kong, we are particularly interested in analyzing how the government uh, either portray the situation as a non-issue or reframe it as a problem, and in exploring the underlying reason for these approaches. So what we did is that we um, select the, um, the news um, paper article from five uh, major Hong Kong newspaper, and um, together um, we have about um, uh, 12,000 um, newspaper and um, um, in our analysis. So um, the reason we use the newspaper, maybe yeah, uh, the reason we use the newspaper because we think that the government used the newspaper to disseminate the information, including the explanation for events that have occurred. And also the opinion leaders of the society use newspaper to share the will about the immigration phenomenon through press conference interview letters to editor and, uh, and their own newspaper columns. So although newspaper readership has declined, but then the margin and his colleagues argue that um, newspapers still are perceived as a common source of news. And many newspaper reports were cited or circulating um, among various media outlets in Hong Kong. So um, what we did, um, I don't want to go into details about this. So basically we used the machine learning um, technique, um, um, which is called the LDA and um, able to help us to um, identify five major themes um, in those um, discussion about the immigration wave in Hong Kong. So, um, so let me quickly to go over the theme. The first theme is about uh, minimizing the significance of the immigration wave. That means they want the government want to play down the importance of the uh, people are moving out. Say, for example, the Secretary for Labor and Welfare, uh, Mr. Chris Sun, um, uh, su suggested that while the working population between age 25 and 30 increased um, by, um, by about 19,500 uh, person in third quarter of 2022, but the uh, increase uh, was lower than the two years before. 
and also some um, um, and then they also an, another report suggested that um, the survey result indicating a high percentage of residents in Hong Kong intended to um, move out uh, can be biased because of the wording of the question and therefore the survey results should not be taken too seriously. So on the one hand, it provides some statistics to say that, oh, it's not a major issue. On the other hand, they also attack some of the, the statistic provide and saying that those are not um, credible. So the second theme is that they report the negative experience of um, immigrants themselves. They describe um, a gloomy pictures of immigrants as people who have lost their home and sell to the unknown quota angry sea. And then they also discuss about the negative experience back home to, um, due to the immigration. And um, so they even suggested that those who move is because they are not very satisfied um, with the career development in Hong Kong. The third thing is about asserting that all consequences of the immigration wave are under control. No matter what aspect, um, the Hong Kong government is well taken care of it, so you don't need to worry. Basically, the whole idea. Because of the time, I have going to move a little bit faster. So theme four um, is discussing the negative consequence of, for the families of those who left Hong Kong. They are saying that basically the idea is that, okay, you left Hong Kong, but then you, you left a, a whole mass of issue that related to your family member back in Hong Kong that um, you create you know, tra um, um, tragic um, uh, incident. For example, your uh, elderly family, no one um, to take care of. So the, um, the, the last film, um, they urge um, the citizens to treasure what they have. So you, so you say that, they say that, well, Hong Kong now re, uh, returned to stability um, and you know, we have a, a good prospect. So you should um, you know, treasure this and it's not, um, you know, it's not something easy to, um, that we have. So um, in short, the conclusion is that the media narratives are important to understand how various actors in society intend to shape public will. As we usually explore the sentiment of local residents towards various issues, including immigration or immigration, it is important to understand any important forces that shape their will. So we identify five major themes in news report and highlight the strategy taken to explain the immigration event. Um, first, some of the report established the will are based on statistics. And it's a significant that um, the collected data highlight the importance of creating the credibility for the will um, propose, uh, propose. At the same time, they provide legitimacy for the arguments suggested. Second, the narrative downplays the negative effect uh, for the immigration wave. And third, the narrative links to ordinary daily life and provide personal story about the negative experience of immigration in the new destination and the suffering of the family member left behind. And finally, the narrative point out the positive aspect of remaining in Hong Kong. So um, in short, I think the narrative suggested that the current situation in Hong Kong is um, business as usual and people should think um, twice um, before they move. And such a narrative can affect how local residents will the consequences of the recent immigration wave and may steer the government away from possible crisis. And um, this is the very preliminary analysis and we are thinking about, uh, because my training is a social demographer and we are thinking about to do some um, causal analysis, multivariate analysis to look at uh, when this um, news come out and how does it um, correspond to the, um, to the number of immigration at different periods of time. All right, so thank you very much. I'm looking forward to discuss with you the topic. Thank you very much, Dr. Fong, for this um, interesting presentation on the political framing and narratives of immigration from Hong Kong. Um, so now we can move to the question and answer um, <laughs> phase of this. Uh, I'd also like to remind everyone in Zoom to please um, type your questions as we um, can take some from Zoom as well. So I open the floor for questions. And if you have questions, please raise your hand and someone will bring a mic. So we have four or five already. Um, let's get on. Thank you. Um, this is a question for Elaine. Uh, Elaine, it was very interesting to hear about the on the ground everyday uh, politics of co-ethnicity, you know, the ways in which uh, Singaporeans of Indian and, and Chinese ethnicity uh, lash out at the at the policies, and then also also the new immigrants, in the way they're talking back as well. 
So I was wondering, um, you, you mentioned and how it reflects on multiculturalism, but I wanted you to maybe say if there's, if you've thought about how that politics of ethnicity reflects on Vertovac's uh, concept of super diversity, because, you know, here you're finding on the ground that super diversity is being challenged in many ways. And so just wanted to ask if you could maybe reflect on that a little bit. Uh, yeah, because, yeah, Yasmin. Oh, that was a great panel. Um, I just super quick question to Elaine. Um, and I, I was just asking for a clarification on the point system that um, Singapore has introduced and where ethnicity fits in there, because I didn't completely understand that. Elaine, um, uh, to you as well. The fact that co-ethnics should be antagonistic to new members coming into their community from their original community is not new, and the fact that governments are not prepared to intercede into that is not new. I mean, exactly the same dynamics are in New Zealand, um, but isn't it a generational effect, and so that you begin to see some of that wash out as um, the children of Chinese or Indian migrants are brought up in Singapore. So I'm just um, wondering whether or not it's a, how deep that racialization towards your co-ethnics is and, and whether or not it's going to have long-term um, structural impacts, barriers in terms of labor markets or whether it will um, wash through and, 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 and not be a long-term issue. Thank you. Are there any questions for Eric specifically? You can raise your hand for Eric. Okay. Oh, there's one. Up Sorry, there. I, I didn't have a question for Eric. Oh, okay. Sorry, I had a question for um, <laughs> like Aline, but I was wondering, um, you had talked about the the status migration narratives that are emerging in Singapore and how like the country is developing an increasingly fine tooth approach to um, migration management. And I was just reflecting on how in Canada, often in media and public narratives, you see like uh, a replication of this very like categorical approach to talking about migration and talking about migrants. And I was wondering if you've noticed um, that these status migration narratives in Singapore around migrant categories have been replicated um, in media and, and in the public as well. We could take one last question here. One. We'll we come uh, back for more questions, don't okay. worry. Okay, <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Fong. Um, I was wondering, are political driven migrants uh, leaving Hong Kong, uh, are they able to organize politically and continue with their activism when they leave, let's say in places like Taiwan? Um, how, what's usually the reaction of the Chinese government when it comes to that? Thank you. Okay, let's uh, take these questions for now and then we come back. Okay. All right. Um, I'll, I'll try and answer all these questions. They're, they're quite different. Okay. So um, the first one is uh, Vindy's on um, how the pol how, how these ideas on politics of co-ethnicity speak to the concept of super diversity. Uh, so I don't think I'm deeply familiar with Stephen Vertovac's idea of super diversity. I might probably know it a little bit more superficially uh, because I think what I work with um, is really how this framework of multiculturalism has been very dominant in government discourses in Singapore and the politics of co-ethnicity actually trouble it. But I would say that uh, even when we talk about um, super diversity, uh, and actually there has been, Stephen Vertovac has carried out research in Singapore uh, to try and flesh out this concept empirically, but I don't think it sufficiently addresses these finer distinctions within the category of race, which is precisely what I'm trying to highlight here. And this category of race or ethnicity actually intersects uh, intimately with other categories to do with uh, nationality distinctions and class. And I think in particular, because of uh, the growing role of China geopolitically, Singapore's proximity to it, both geographically as well as culturally. So it actually has accentuated concerns 
uh, both in government circles as well as Singaporeans themselves about what co-ethnicity actually means for Singapore's uh, domestic politics. Uh, so that's my reply to Bindi's question. Uh, the question, uh, second question was asking for clarification on how the point-based system actually uh, um, sort of speaks to uh, concerns around diversity. So uh, I think, you know, I wasn't able to elaborate on it, but the backdrop of it is there have been concerns acknowledged by um, the Singapore government as well that uh, some employers that have uh, sort of hired many immigrant um, who are immigrants who are in managerial positions when they when they themselves employ new um, when when they recruit new employees they tend to employ also from the same ethnic or nationality group so it leads Singaporeans to feel that for example in the financial and banking sector IT sectors there's a uh, overpopulation or overrepresentation of um, uh, sort of uh, new immigrants especially from India so the points based system is actually meant to address that concern because uh, depending on a firm's sort of track record of uh, have you employed sufficient Singaporeans uh, relative to foreigners, number one. Number two, does the addition of these, this new employee adds to diversity of your firm rather than reinforcing you know, certain nationality or ethnic uh, sort of um, uh, yeah, representations, right? That then factors into the way that the Singapore government uh, gives points or deducts points. So I'm not sure, maybe, you know, if any of you know whether other countries practice this, uh, using the points-based system as a way of calibrating uh, firm behavior, uh, please come up to me later to let me know, because um, actually I, I, I'm not sure, you know, if this is replicated elsewhere. Okay, um, the other question on, I think this was um, Paul's question, right, that uh, antagonism towards co-ethnics is not new and whether generationally, you know, these kinds of antagonisms are mitigated or sort of dilute over time. So in the interviews I've done with Chinese and Indian immigrants, um, I think what's interesting here is the Chinese immigrants tend to say that, you know, our children have become localized. So the, the for example, sons, you know, have served national service they now speak of a Singlish accent. So they will become accepted in Singapore compared to my generation. And I think to some extent that generational effect, you know, of um, this sort of uh, uh, distinguishing between, you know, you're an immigrant versus a Singaporean, that can be reduced. But I think the current moment is such that it's the role of China's um, geopolitical influence in the region that has as I mentioned earlier, accentuated concerns about whether these Chinese immigrants are indeed loyal to Singapore. Now, the Indian immigrants are, interestingly, of at least the ones we've interviewed uh, from our Aging Immigrants Project, quite a number of them say that their children have actually re-migrated. So they've not remained in Singapore. And in other words, with that project, we're finding that there are differences between the Chinese and the Indian uh, kind of uh, immigrants and their family uh, sort of whether their children actually remain in Singapore is something I think we need to explore a bit more. Okay, last question. Um, have migrant categories been replicated in the Singapore media? Uh, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, uh, understanding the question fully, but the, the straightforward answer is yes. The Singapore uh, media actually uh, replicates um, kind of these discussions around um, based on the multicultural framework, but at the same time, you know, that it, it doesn't directly address the, or highlight, you know, the kind of um, dissatisfaction that Singaporeans on the ground may feel towards the new immigrants. But um, I think, you know, it's partly because, uh, especially with the uh, sort of uh, official or former news outlets in Singapore, um, they probably, you know, have been advised by editors to, uh, edit their stories a little. I think that's my speculation, at least. Okay, over to Eric. Eric, you have to turn it on. Yeah, I... I... Yeah. Sorry, you have to turn it on. Okay, yeah, um, thank you for the question. Um, my understanding that actually um, those um, uh, residents in Hong Kong, they after they move out, um, no matter where they are, I think they organize and they uh, sometimes they even organize protests and everything. So how the um, um, the Hong Kong government um, respond and I um, um, usually I, I cannot say how do they respond, but at least because they know that um, the um, these people, they have the right to protest um, in other places. Um. 
we can now have more questions. So I know Rika had a question. Vinod has a question here. Hi, Elaine. So, um, I mean, it's a, for Elaine and uh, Eric. So, uh, Elaine, uh, welcome to Toronto. And I think uh, you've been uh, to Canada for many times. So, um, my question is, that I think there might be when we say aging migrants, I think that is also something and not just on like a city state level, but then in the Canadian context, that this might be something that we may have to, you know, grapple with or maybe we're grappling with now, but we, we have like some studies, say, for example, coming from, say, Naomi Lightman, who's like thinking about how do you care for the caregivers? But then again, I think there's a difference in, say, caregiving in Singapore, and we're talking about like caregiving liberally as in like domestic workers and caregivers that in Singapore you provide, I mean, there's they're temporary, and then, but then they're, permanent, like meaning they've been there, as you mentioned, they've been there for, you know, the longest time and probably their whole, you know, their whole life course. But then in CAT, we have that, you know, we have sort of recently or maybe the last decade that uh, a pathway to citizenship has been provided for this caregivers. But then again, my question is more of like, do you think, I mean, is this sort of citizenship sustainable? So meaning, you have these aging migrants who are probably categorized as lower skilled and lower wage. And then, so the question is like, how do you, how, how do you navigate aging in that sense? You mentioned that, you know, there is this aspect of say migrant health, like, you know, um, insurance and how, you know, they're aging, they need to see a doctor, then how do they pay for their bills? And I thought it's sort of a similar in say in Canada, and how, you know, these migrants who were not able to put in that much money, for example, to, but then again, you have, would say, oh, well, we have universal health care. But then aging has that other aspect of other care, you know, um, like getting someone to care for an aging person. So, you know, does that, does government, you know, look into that and, you know, that sort of thing. I mean, I'm, I'm just asking. And also the role of transnationalism. Okay. And then the other one for Eric, sorry, sorry. And then the other one for Eric is return migrants. Hong Kong has the largest Canadian, um, overseas, overseas Canadians. And because you have a lot of these, you know, I mean, the connection between you know, Hong Kong Chinese and Canada. So my question is, don't you, I mean, will you be looking at the aspect of return migrants and how return has sort of played in this aspect? Is that really return? Like when they come back, the same time they get family members. So the level of immigration might also be connected with like they emigrate because they have family members here. So meaning like children of returnees. All right. Uh, someone can get a mic for Binod. And then there are a few at the back also. Um, thank you so much for the uh, interesting presentation. I have a question for Dr. Fong. Uh, you mentioned the immigrant wave during the COVID-19. Um, people in Hong Kong moved to UK, Canada, Australia, or other places. I just wonder, except the government narrative, what is the internet narrative? And how these two different types of narrative interact? And this, this Immigrant also uh, wave also reminded me of what happened maybe 40 years ago, right? <laughs> Another huge immigrant wave uh, in Hong Kong before, you know. <laughs> so what's the difference between these two, between the narrative, um, the narrative between these two waves? And I know that people in Hong Kong, they have already experienced a huge wave before. So that will affect their understanding of how the government tells the story and how they will consider about this situation by their own way. Thank you. Thank you, Binod. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> um, well, I, I have a, a question to Elaine and then another short one to Eric. Um, for Elaine, uh, I would like to borrow from our yesterday's discourse uh, uh, in terms of uh, Matthias Threepold. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, so 
I'm borrowing from yesterday's discourse on uh, threefold micro level, meso level, and macro level that Matias had uh, spoken about, uh, and trying to look at the Singapore situation from that point of view. And you have, uh, uh, you know, nicely uh, pointed out the watershed of 2011. So pre 2011. Uh, policies in Singapore and post 2011, and particularly with the maids policy. And I am reminded at the macro level, I'm reminded of the Nobel laureate, yet to be Nobel laureate Michael Kramer's 2000, who got his Nobel Prize in 2019 in economics. Uh, his work, his pioneering work on Singapore in 2005 was on the maids policy that the foreign domestic workers made uh, release time you know, for, the, for the native highly skilled women for workforce and their labor force participation had gone up uh, significantly because of that. And I think that uh, that has its implications on the foreign domestic workers policy later on. And in terms of meso level, um, I would like your attention uh, to the fact that how these maids are being paid. When they are being paid, then at least 50% of that salary goes into what is called provident fund. Now, where is that spent? I mean, is it spent on the welfare of the uh, activities of the migrant domestic workers, foreign domestic workers, or it's spent on some other activities by the government? I think that there's not much work on, on that at all. Uh, when it comes to micro level, I have a, uh, curiosity and question. I was myself um, in Singapore for uh, two years at the National University of Singapore during the time when Michael Kramer was doing this work. Uh, and I was under the impression that foreign domestic workers are not allowed to, the women workers are not allowed to get pregnant in Singapore. Uh, that's a human rights question. So I'm drawing your attention to that. I have a very short question to uh, Eric. Uh, you mentioned about the emigration of the protesters uh, of the movement, you know, drivers of the movement in, in Hong Kong. And I think that's a reminder of a, uh, a situation that happened in India long back, the Naxalite movement that had happened in West Bengal was, you know, neutralized because of large scale out migration uh, of students and, you know, bright people, talented people. Uh, from Bengal to outside, and some concerns were, were shared about that. So is it going to be a similar situation that it is going to adversely affect the social movement that are necessary for our change in political situation, political narratives, and, and times to come? Thank you. Thank you. I think we have two questions in Zoom. Uh, so let's do that. And then um, I think that's all the questions we here have time to take. Okay, thank you, Visa, for Dr. Fung. So the first one is, are there indications that the media is partnering with the government to further the government's narrative? Secondly, is the media offering alternative reporting on how well immigrants are doing in their new homes or countries? And finally, has your team formed an initial hypothesis regarding the relationship between the timing of government narratives and immigration waves? Thank you. Do you want to take it, Elaine? Okay, so uh, I think uh, Rika's question, right, to do with, um, I, I think broadly it's about, you know, Canada has this uh, sort of framework that allows domestic workers or living caregivers to uh, obtain permanent residence citizenship, whereas in Singapore there's no such uh, option, right? Uh, yes, uh, structurally that's correct. And uh, I think you asked me, you know, what is the difference in terms of how it matters for their aging and caregiving. So I think that was what your question is about. I think the difference has to do with the security of residency, number one, um, and also what it means for access to kind of basic social protection. So I would say being able to become a citizen, even if earlier on, you know, you were lower skilled, lower income, but at least as a citizen, you have um, access to some basic social protection. Whereas in the case of the domestic workers in Singapore, because they are perpetually on temporary work visas, there is the insecurity of their residency. Um, and that in turn actually has an impact on 
uh, sort of how they think about their work in relation to their own healthcare and emotional needs, right? So I think specifically, um, the Singapore government, as well as employers themselves, including female employers, they actually benefit from this protracted transience. So actually, um, some domestic workers have aged, you know, in, in their households, in employers' households, but have the, have the employers really thought about what are the aging needs of their domestic workers? I suspect not, uh, because um, th it is a, a way for, I think as um, this uh, gentleman has highlighted, it's a way for the Singaporean women, you know, and their households to continue to uh, sort of um, benefit, you know, from the social reproductive work done by the domestic worker. Um, the other thing is, you know, actually in Singapore, the dom employers are now required to buy medical insurance uh, for the domestic workers. And more recently, I think the kind of minimum uh, quantum, the amount has uh, been increased um, as a requirement by the Singapore government. But even if there exists this kind of medical insurance, I think, you know, we have to question whether or not the domestic workers who are in uh, precarious working situations would actually highlight their healthcare needs, especially when it comes to aging healthcare needs, because they may fear that their, their employers will send them back and that will cut off, you know, their financial um, means as well as the emotional bonds that have cultivated over the years in Singapore. Uh, I think the question that you asked about CPF, uh, the Central Provident Fund, from my understanding, our foreigners are actually not required to pay into the CPF. So um, both, you know, my colleagues say in the university, and I don't think the domestic workers are required to pay to pay into it. And if they did, it would be very troubling because their incomes are already very, very low. Um, and I agree with you that, um, you know, Domestic workers in Singapore are not allowed to get pregnant. And uh, it's not only just a human right issue, but it also has um, direct implications for how employers think about whether or not they should retain their domestic workers. So um, someone I know personally said to me, uh, she, she, her, her domestic worker got married recently, went back home to get married, and she eventually decided not to um, uh, retain the employment of a domestic work because the domestic worker's husband was also coming to Singapore. So she didn't want to be responsible, you know, for her security bond, I think of $5,000 being confiscated if a domestic worker got pregnant with the domestic worker's husband. So uh, it is a very complicated situation. I think I've answered all the questions. So I'll uh, pass it over to Eric. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a lot of questions. So I just um, combine um, them and see whether I can answer quickly. Um, um, well, first of all, yes, def definitely there are a lot of Canadians um, in, in Hong Kong. Um, so um, I think there's um, um, the estimate, I think is like over 100,000 uh, in Hong Kong. So, of course, that not everyone they, they decided to um, return. It depends on how they interpret the um, the whole event happening in Hong Kong. So, um, we don't know how many returned um, because the reason is um, they just need to purchase an air ticket and then they can fly back to um, to Canada. So, there's no way to count how many of them they return back. I think what we can do is based on the turn um, this coming 2020. Uh, maybe the next census, 2026, and then um, use the 2021 census, and then we can know exactly how many um, uh, increase um, from those from Hong Kong. Um, so that's um, so that's um, answering one question, and then um, the another question I I don't hear too well because of the echo. Um, uh, so I so are you referring to the 1997 um, immigration comparing to current immigration wave? Um, yeah. I see. Um, I don't think at that time there's a major um, narrative um, discussed in, in, um, by the government, because remember, uh, before that, that is the British government, and then um, after 1997, that we, we have another government, which is um, the, uh, that's the special administrative um, 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 district government. Um, so, but then the thing is that I think the reason why people move um, in this two immigration wave um, are somewhat different. Uh, 1997, uh, there's a lot of study actually at that time, even in, um, from Canadian scholar, um, suggested that um, they move is because of uncertainty. They don't know what will going to happen, so they, they move. Um, but then this time is somewhat different. It's, it's more like they know what is going on. They are not very happy, so they, therefore they move. So the, um, the reason of moving is somewhat different. So therefore, uh, unless there will be changes um, uh, in the reason uh, in, in the next uh, few years, if not, I don't think this um, uh, immigrant, they will return. But the earlier period, 
they come to Canada, they, they go to um, Australia or to UK, um, they observe. If things are okay, then they will return. Um, so that's the, the major difference. And, uh, um, and also about the immigration, um, um, that um, they are not necessary. They, um, I mean, the immigrant, those who move out, not necessary. They participate in the event. Um, they may just um, sympathetic, or they are not very happy with the changes and uh, in the society, so they decided to move. Um, so there, we we are talking about a group of people, but I think because of the time, uh, with different um, um, reason of moving, um, because of the time, I didn't expand um, further. Um, and then um, the 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 last set of question is mainly about the government and and the, and and about the policy and the immigration wave. And I would think that um, the um, the way to understand about this immigration wave, of course, is related to government. But at the same time, is that the major um, societal changes that really trigger people um, to move. So um, so I think it's difficult to develop um, any hypothesis about. Um, the behavior of the government and the, and and the the wave of the immigration. So because we are talking about um, the 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 major societal changes involving uh, different aspects of the society. Thank you very much all for your questions and for the stimulating discussion and a special thanks to both the speakers. Um, 